Welcome to the CTO studio. I have Larry Hemminger with me today. We talk about optimism, longevity, and giving back in a Santa suit. Take a listen. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. see, see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Welcome to the CTO studio. We have Larry Hemminger, CTO of Sapiens Data Science with us. Welcome. Hi. Welcome to the CTO studio. Thank you. Happy to be here. How does it, does, how does it look? It looks awesome. It looks very high tech. I'm in the right place. One thing I noticed about uh, one of our emails was that, one, that Dennis Ritchie was one of your... Yeah. Dennis Ritchie is one of mine. Awesome. Creators of Unix. Well, you and I are roughly the same age, and you know, I grew up on KNRC, oh, wow. right? That's so, amazing. Yeah. So tell me about your journey uh, getting to become the CTO of Sapiens. Well, yeah, it's been really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I was with my former company at EcoATM for uh, about seven and a half years. Started there from the very early startup days through acquisition, going public through acquisition, going back to private. Did some really awesome work there uh, that was in the automated retail, you know, recycling of cell phone business. Um, built some amazing kiosks, amazing back end, and just kind of time to to look for something new and different. And in my journey, um, I really wanted to look for something that was of benefit to to all of us. And you know, I, I've worked in healthcare once before as a startup, mm -hmm. and just kind of found um, a couple different startups here in San Diego that were health tech related. This one really turned me on because of our CEO Brad Perkins. He was one of the uh, on the founding team of Human Longevity, so he's he's been into health tech and genomics, and and is super passionate about what we're doing. And he and he made me want to work for the company from our first interview. <laughs> and that is a phenomenal value, a mission, right? I mean... It is. His, he's trying it, to do what he was doing at HLI, but do a little bit different. So this is a platform that can, essentially for, for all of us, could um, point out ways to extend your life. So I love our, how you said. I love how you said we're in the business of adding more birthdays. Yeah, that that's kind of the company tagline. I love it. You I know, how, it. how could you not be successful oh when when you're in the business of adding birthdays? And so you're coming in from a, uh, if I should, if I can juxtapose, you know, the Eco ATM, amazing company, helping many people not waste away their iPhones, but you know, kind of, or their mobile mm -hmm. phones, making a switch into health tech. Uh, what was there a mind shift for you in that? Is it, is it CTOing? Uh, like what kind of mindset are you in now? Coming from sort of a hardcore retail, I suppose, well, not retail space, yeah, into like the retail. health health tech space. Yeah, it, there's a many similarities and and some differences. So I'm kind of happy not to be in the e-commerce space at the moment. That's that's got its own set of challenges and and idiosyncrasies kind of switching from helping to save planet earth to helping save us um, from ourselves essentially is, is, is so it, it's very similar. Um, I feel like I spend so much time at work, so much time and effort and, and I enjoy it. I, I don't ever see myself retiring for that reason. Um, uh, but, but since I spend so much time, I want to feel like I'm, I'm doing something good, not mm. just making money, mm. but doing, having some impact on people. And I felt like we did that at Eco ATM, and mm. we helped save land. You know, instead of putting phones into landfills, That's you're amazing. you're you're remanufacturing them, and and that was that was amazing, and felt really good about it. And they're still doing a really good job of that. Uh, and then just kind of refocusing on what can we do for people, and and what's the the health the health industry is changing so so rapidly. You know, it, it won't be very long before you know we're we're using. Genomics to the point where, you know, you, you can be predictive about, okay, you're going to have this particular issue and we're going to treat ETN differently than Larry because of what we know about you personally. And, um, you know, it, it, what this healthcare business looks like in 10 years, uh, I can only imagine. And you're it, getting a bird's eye view with uh, the data you're processing. Yeah. 
with the data we're processing and honestly with the people and our CEO that, that I'm working with. Are we just are we just oblivious to what what data is out there? I don't think it's oblivious. I think the problem is um uh, I, I think there's, there's a statistic that also was very interesting uh, uh, that was presented to me before I joined the company, and that's that it takes an average of 17 years for a medical breakthrough or some interesting or some clinically proven ways to interpret data to make it to your family physician's office. 17 years. So one of the other taglines of our company is providing health care at the speed of science as opposed to at the speed of medicine. And that's what I think is going to change mm. is speeding up this this proven information that can help in, help improve your life and your health, you know, much, 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 much faster. So how, how much of what you're building and what any health tech company is building is is uh, ex- accelerating on the tech and the science, but then hits the roadblocks of regulation and and stereotypes? Yeah, that's. <clears throat> there's definitely challenges. Any any healthcare company is going to be challenged with regulation and with uh, data privacy and security. You know, so that that's a, that's a very very important aspect. So, um, what what I'll do is I'll kind of explain the basic strategy. I I kind of call it design for success. And what I mean by that is assume. So this would apply to startups. It, I have some experience in in previous startups, kind of thinking this way could also apply to larger companies but if you assume the company will be successful and you and making that assumption you you draw out an architecture what does this thing look like a couple of years from now what if we do a great job and 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 we scale this thing the way that we think we can what compliance issues do we have to deal with such as data security privacy hipaa fda you know those those sort of things every day in my job as cto every day you're making decisions you're you're thinking about how to design things and you're working with the development team and you're choosing technology partners. So, so in our case, to, to answer your question, I'm choosing technology partners that can satisfy the security requirements. It doesn't always cost more. It costs you more in terms of thinking it out. When you're choosing architectures, when you're choosing cloud, when you're choosing databases, when you're choosing development languages, every decision you make in building your tech stack I tend to think of what does this look like three years from now? Wow. What issues are we going to have? What security compliance do we need? Do, do we need to satisfy? What sort of auditing things are we going to need? And keep that in mind yeah. as you're as you're making decisions. One of the promises I made to our to my CEO is, hey, Le- hey, Larry, promise me you're not going to do something quick and dirty, and you're not going to have to throw it away and 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 cost me a million dollars later to rebuild it. Um, I think he's had a negative experience in that area and I've seen it, you know, myself. Um, I think our role as CTOs is different from, I'm not just a software developer. Mm. The role of CTO is to advise and Mm. to analyze and to design something that can stand the test of scale. And um, it's not always the, the fastest path to demonstrating something it it's it's the correct path and maybe it takes me a couple extra days to do something or whatnot but if it can be done in such a way that it can scale with the mm. minimum of reuse and and particularly to your question about security um if it can be done in such a way that it can be certified and it's on that path mm. it's so much less painful to design it up front with that in mm. mind than it is to redesign it later yeah i love i love the design for success design for success mm-hmm I love that because oftentimes, even when I was talking to you, I immediately did the, well, you guys could be innovating all day long, but you're going to run up against this roadblock. Right. Of, but I think what I'm hearing you say is design for success, be optimistic, mm-hmm. set aggressive mm-hmm. goals, but assume that there's going to be scale and success and, and, and right. don't, don't, don't limit the whole thing to a uh well we'll get to that later because right. you know this thing might go but from a real world perspective you will deal with a lot of stuff later right we don't know everything or yeah, or yeah. or we'd be geniuses but, but to not but to not limit yourself in the now is what that's you're right saying. don't yeah the the best solution for now may not be the quick and dirty solution yeah right it, it maybe it is but maybe it isn't but how do you know unless you know what success looks like yeah so, oh, so okay so you're saying 
uh, design for success is okay. I'm 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 about to have an architecture meeting. I'm about <laughs> to have a product meeting. Uh, let's not pretend like three years from now doesn't exist. Right. Let's visualize or let's talk about. Hey, there's a scenario where three years from now we look like this. Mm-hmm. Can we design a system today that can get us to that place? Yes. Now, what would you say to the detractors who say that you shouldn't scale until it's time to scale? Uh, that's absolutely right. I'm not saying you, you build scale from day one. I'm saying you make decisions that can scale. Mm. You know, so you, you're making decisions like what, what's very popular now in the cloud is serverless architecture, mm. right? Um, so the great news about that is it doesn't cost you. It, you pay as you go. So if I'm not using very many resources now, then I'm not paying very much in the early days. As that scales, we may need to evolve that to reserved instances and things that, that cost less, but, but there's an evolution there, but you're keeping the end side of mind. Okay, I know that down the road, I've got a million users. Right now, I have 10. Mm. What's that path look like such that I don't have to throw this thing away? I could just add, mm. add capacity. Does that add... So you have to obviously, as CTO, keep in mind then that that adds cost at the beginning. Yeah. Front-loading some cost in order to make those right decisions. In my experience, it's been pretty minimal extra cost. Mm. It's just really a a mindset, a team mindset. It comes back to selecting technologies that can can scale both in terms of capacity and cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how and and your CEO, your hey, your CEO trusts you. So far, so good. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But you know what? One you know kind of case in point. Um, uh, this is my fourth startup from from the ground up, and I've advised others. Um, what most people come to ask me is, Larry, I'd like to see a technology build. I want to know what what this looks like and what it's going to cost. So to answer that question, you have to figure out. Not only what does success look like, but what does business success look like? How are we selling this, this system or product or platform? How does that then translate into a successful technology architecture to address the business success? Mm. Then I can figure out what piece of that system do I need to build now? Now, yes. And, it, it, and there, there's two very different stories to tell. There's one story that says, I'm not quite sure where we're going but I know I've been asked to demonstrate this particular capability. And so I'm just going to do that as fast as I can. Okay. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to say, I've thought this out. I think I know what technology success looks like for this company. And I'm going to build this piece of that. And when I'm done, I've got 10% Mm, of this done as opposed to, as opposed to, I don't know what percentage I have done, but I know that I've demonstrated something that I might need to throw away. But isn't that former one cheaper generally than the the latter? Could be. Yeah. And so I think, I mean, I I love that. Um, I think also there's this fallacy of uh, the former scenario where you say, I'm going to throw it away, but then really you don't. And it gets, no, that that's the realistic scenario. And then you get, then you get locked with this big technical debt problem. And, and everyone's got technical debt, but if you can make decisions on a day-to-day basis to try to minimize, mm. that I think mm. comes back to the role of a CTO mm. is, can I look my investors and my CEO in the face and say, we've made really good decisions to minimize, minimize the throwaway or mm. min- minimize the refactoring or min- minimize the technical debt. Are you managing, how, lo- how large is the team that that you're ma- you guys are really just at the beginning, right? No, so. we're, we're very early on. I went and onboarded, um, what I uh, call a nearshore team. So they're just over the border in, in Tijuana and they're doing an awesome job. So we, we've done with, this, with a fairly small investment, we've done a, a ton of work. We've got a, a, a platform up and running. We've got our mobile app up and running. We have a lot of data acquisition taking place. We're um, uh, working with some technology partners that have helped accelerate you know, what we're doing. Um, and again, back to kind of the strategy, I think I've chosen some technology partnerships that have been low cost based on um, fairly low usage at the moment, mm. but will scale with us. Um, mm. One of the um, friends of, of seven CTOs is, is Snowflake Computing. Mm. And I chose them as my data warehouse a database essentially because of that, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, they have an addition that's fully HIPAA compliant. Encryption and management of, of, of keys is all part of the service. So from day one, I, I signed an agreement with them such that I'm, I'm 
I'm compliant in a security perspective, but they, I'm also being billed based on my usage. That's the way, you know, their model works. So I don't need to create, um, reserved, uh, Amazon instances that uh, have traditional, you know, databases on them, which has been my former experience. This is completely pay as you go. Um, the more users we have, the more compute mm. we're going to use. And I feel like that's a very scalable solution. Um, it literally cost me pennies the first mm. couple months of, mm. of development because we just weren't using much. Um, the more we use, you know, the more we pay mm. and the better the deal we can get. But that's just an example of a decision you can make that scales. Yeah, because now you're banking on a key component and especially with, you know, ingesting all your data sources, you know, making a, I mean, I feel like that is a key piece of your architecture that you is not throw away. It, it's absolutely key. Being in the healthcare and, and bioinformatics, life science mm. industry, data is the company. Mm, absolutely. Right? And um, I feel like th in this particular decision, healthcare and health tech is a big vertical market for this company. So we're aligned with where they want to go. And they're working with some of the big names, you know, in the business. So I feel like I'm in good company. Mm. Um, they're a modern solution to what, other companies may solve using a Hadoop, um, you know, sort of an architecture, which, which Hadoop is not easy to manage. Um, Hadoop takes people that know what the heck they're doing mm. to set these things up and uh, create these, these, these Hadoop clusters. Um, I've managed to create everything we need with the Snowflake uh, as a service myself. Um, I wouldn't proclaim literally, to be literally myself. Wowzers. And I wouldn't ever put the term DBA on my resume. Um, but I, that, that's an area that I can contribute directly with, with my team. And, and, it, and it, I wouldn't say it's been trivial, but it's been straightforward and has cost me as a, as the CTO so much less money and resource as standing up a traditional, even a, a RDS instance would have taken more effort than, yeah, than what this yeah. has taken. Can you briefly speak to the difference? Uh, so, you know, the map reduce concept versus a snowflake approach, those two juxtapositions positioned. And yeah. then um, can you just explain what snowflake is to people who don't know what that is? So let me, let me start with the latter, if that's mm. okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not I'm here to advertise for, no, for any no, particular no. Uh, supplier, but... We'll bleep they're, those out. <laughs> they're a fairly new company, been around a few years, a Bay Area company, who, who is, um, I think they're going to a multi-cloud. I think they're, they're, they're on Amazon, Google, and Azure. So they've, they've designed a data warehouse as a service, which is more of a columnar database as opposed to a transactional database. But they're, um, they're leveraged. The whole service is managed. Um, uh, Redundancy, scalability, security, um, they provide uh, pretty much everything you need out of the box in a web UI to configure your system, design a schema, um, and get up and running with, with really having to buy no other tools whatsoever. Um, uh, they manage all aspects of, of availability and performance. With a, with a couple of mouse clicks, you can scale your your compute side of, of the system from, from an extra small, which is minimal, minimal cost to an extra large. Um, uh, they support clustering and balancing and, and, and a petabyte, you know, sort of, mm. sort of scale. So I, I go from having had less than a megabyte of storage when I got started to now I don't, we don't have a, a ton of storage yet, but, but you don't really get, you don't really pay for storage mm. as opposed to other technologies such as a Redshift or, or other databases where you have to pay for the, for the, for the S, S3 storage mm. or wherever that mm. data is stored. Um, you really don't pay much for the storage. You pay on use of mm. the data. And I like that model. And so the nice thing about that as you are CTOing a startup is you are, you've, you've picked uh, a component to your data storage, which is probably the, one of the most important ones that can scale yes now does does data warehousing as a service does that provide you with this that's not sql i mean do you query it with its own language yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of an interesting combination of a sql and a no sql capability all both at once because because from what i remember i think is, is that it, it, you can basically select all these disparate data sources yeah and it will so, sort of make it available so that was that was very interesting to me since we we're acquiring everything from everybody mm. in all different sort mm. of formats. Genomics formats are all over the road. 
um, uh, all the IoT devices are sending us data in, in, in lo lots of different formats. So they have a couple capabilities that were really of interest to me. One, one is their support for semi-structured data. So you can store JSON data, XML data, other, other kind of semi-structured formats right natively in the database as you would in a document database. Um, they, but they also have, it's also a relational database. So I, I can store JSON data in what they call a variant column and query it directly. So the nice thing I like about that is as we're adding more and more and more data items that we're collecting, I can just keep adding to, to, my, to my database without changing the schema whatsoever. Mm. And that was one of my lessons learned from, from previous jobs is the amount of baggage you carry around with, it, with, a, with a normalized, fairly traditional database schema. You, you have to carry a lot of baggage with that. Every time there's a new feature that requires a new column or a, or a new table, we've got to go do that. We've got to go test it. And, and ma managing the schema is time consuming and costly. Mm. I'm trying to make decisions now such that the data, it's completely data driven and it can be dynamic with a minimal of impact to, to changing the schema. And so we're, 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 we're taking data as we get it. We're storing it directly in the database and with the added advantage of I can directly query it and I can directly make it visible to our analytics and, and, and dashboards mm, and stuff without it. having to, you know, pre-process yeah, it. Yeah. So the, to me, the days of ET, traditional ETLs, I'm trying to avoid moving data at all. I'm trying to keep it in one place, but separate the data by schema and separate the data in terms of who's processing what um, uh, uh, instead of moving data around. So you can dump the JSON arrays or whatever format into a column Yep. and then it will somehow index it so that you can do It indexes queries. it on the fly. Okay. So you can, you can take this unstructured data and you can flatten it out both dynamically in terms of a query or you could even create temp tables or permanent tables that are that have columns um, by the by the object names that are in that JSON data, uh, in which case you'd have a sparsely populated matrix. Mm. So not every row in your database is going to have every JSON object. No, and I love that as well. So it, it totally minimizes the effort of just sucking in this data and getting it stored and making it visible. Um, another way to solve that problem almost makes it trivial, isn't it? I wouldn't say trivial, but it certainly makes it straightforward, more straightforward than it would have been. Other people may solve the problem using some of the Amazon features. So Amazon's got Athena, mm. I think, where, where you're, you're storing, the essentially you're storing JSON formatted data on S3 and then you're querying it you know, from there. So it's kind of similar to that, except that I'm getting the best of both worlds, unstructured and, and relational SQL in the same product and I can query it the same way. And as a matter of fact, I've structured my table so that I've got the JSON and traditional relational columns in the same table and kind of using the best of both worlds simultaneously. It. So it, it's really interesting, and time will prove out whether I've made an intelligent decision or not, but um, it's uh, certainly unique and something I wanted to, to, to play with. And, uh, and, but you did consider the Hadoop MapReduce approach. Um, I don't think given, um, given resources available to us, I don't think I could have got to where I've gotten with the resources that yeah, were yeah, that would be available yeah. to me and and my lack of Hadoop. Yeah, cuz you know, I think what what would have happened probably was again thinking about minimizing your uh you know need for resources while also scaling the building the company um to to you would have had to go out and go hire a, a you know a Hadoop expert or something. Yep. So thinking about the growth of Sapiens, do, right now sort of you leading a, a, near, a near shore resource, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, putting your CTO process hat on, like what do you see as the next step for, again, thinking about the CTOs out there who are mm -hmm. also trying to do as much as they can with as mm -hmm. little as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the near shoring idea sounds amazing. What is the next step of growth for you in your team? Uh, as you see yeah, the other technology. That's a, that's a great question um, in terms of uh, both technology build and staff associated staff build. So the plan is to bring, identify the top key leadership management positions and bring those in house. Um, machine learning is, is a big area for us. So we'll, we'll probably bring um, some expertise in on that. Um, uh, 
some of the other key aspects would be um, cloud architect, DevOps, um, QA management, et cetera. So some my, my top tier really lead positions as we start to scale and, and, and go through different funding milestones, we'll want to bring in house, but continue to leverage the near shore uh, uh, capabilities and skills mm. um, for, for a lot of these roles. I, I don't see that ever going away. Mm. I see the leadership being, you know, uh, more direct in-house positions. So that's probably the next step, but continuing to leverage um, uh, readily available skills uh, that are in the same time zone is really important to me. Yeah. Um, and physically close by. Really. And physically close by. So we meet fairly regularly. Uh, I've gone down to their office. They've come up to ours. Um, I feel like it's a super cooperative, you know, arrangement. And I feel like because they're same time zone, I can I can meet with them face to face when whenever we we need to. Um, that they feel much less remote than than, than if they were truly. Do you have any offshore. tips? Do you have any tips for CTOs who are managing near shore resources? Things that you, uh, well, you know, things that I may take for granted. Or might think, oh, great, this is easy. We're same time zone. We're close mm-hmm. by. Mm-hmm. But are there little nuances or, or things that you've noticed that if if I don't stick to this, then things kind of fade a little bit? Or? I, I think um, you need to think of those resources as just being your extended team. Um, they 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 should be flexible and follow whatever process you feel is appropriate to your business and to your your engineering or technology team. Um, I found them to be super, uh, flexible in terms of, um, the way we want to run our, our, our agile development. They've, they've added a lot of value to that in, in, in bringing best practice and having worked for many other companies as clients. So I think it's a two way street in terms of, of determining what works best for both parties. Mm. But I think just keeping in mind they're, they're your extended team mm. and, um, but you're still establishing culture. You're still establishing. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a joint responsibility. Yeah. But definitely for the CTO to say the, the, this is what's important to yeah. me, and you know we do our daily standups. We do some one on ones, just as if they were, you know, down down mm. down the the hall mm. from you. So I I think of them that way, but I also think about it as cooperative. You know, mm. it has to work for both for both parties. Mm. Do you think that you and I are young mm-hmm. enough to benefit from? Your technologies? Yes, absolutely. You think that we're gonna I'm gonna have more birthdays possibly. Absolutely. So our our target rich environment, I I uh, I believe is forty to seventy five. Wow. So we got a ways to go, man. I'm only forty six. <laughs> forty to seventy five is is the target rich area. So not that not to say that, ev- that everyone will be able to benefit, absolutely. <sighs> But when you're young, you could probably abuse yourself a little bit and get away with it a little bit more. Um, when you're on the upper end of things, um, uh, things are going to naturally the, the, turn out. The recovery out. is a little harder. Yeah. But that, that sweet spot of, I'll use the term loosely, middle age, um, I resemble that remark. Um, we're in the sweet spot because there are things you could do right this minute that can absolutely add years to your life and, and certainly reduce the odds of... Please of, give me two or three of those tips. Uh, happy to do so. Thank so you. one a couple of the areas that we're targeting early on is um, pre-diabetes and, and heart disease or ischemic heart disease. Pre-diabetes is something that... So, you know, timing is perfect. When I joined Sapiens Data Science was right about the time I was due for my annual checkup. So I did my annual checkup and, and then I joined Sapiens like a day or two later. Lo and behold, my glucose level was a little high. I wasn't diabetic in the uh, pre-diabetic range. There's a, there's a measurement called your hemoglobin uh, A1C measurement, which is an average over the last 90 days of kind of what your sugar level has been. Mm-hmm. And um, anything less than, I think they say 5.7 and below, is normal 5.7 to 6.4 is pre-diabetic and anyone over 6.4 is diabetic type 2 diabetic i should say so type 2 diabetes uh is not you're not diagnosed at birth that way it's something you develop as you get older and um so lo and behold you know i'm carrying a couple extra pounds and my uh my a1c uh was a a 5.8 i believe 5.9 which is right in the middle of that pre-diabetic range and and the medical literature out there says, hey, that can be just as dangerous as being diabetic. 
mainly because your doctor is not going to prescribe something for that. Oh. Insurance typically will not reimburse you because you're not diabetic yet. It's something you need to be aware of. And from the numbers I recall being quoted, there's something uh, tens of millions of Americans are in that range and may or may not know it. And they may not know how dangerous it is. Mm. So, so right now I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor. It's a little device that attaches to your skin. It's made by a company right down the street at Dexcom. So, you know, hooray Dexcom, another plug for a technology company. Um, so we're hoping to partner with Dexcom as part of our protocol to say, hey, look, um, we're going to ask you to sign on to our platform. We'd like to, you to go get some lab tests and see where you're at, right? Something you should be doing for your annual physical anyway. Uh, and, and if you're in that range, we might recommend you wear one of these things to figure out your individual response to, to food. Everyone is different, mm. right? What, what I was um, mentioning right before we started this conversation, um, uh, I seem to have a reaction to white rice. My glucose level is good. I have lunch with uh, a, po- a tuna pokey and on top of rice, mm. and boosh, my my glucose skyrockets. So, uh, what affects me may be different from what affects you. And and if you're kind of in that range, we would recommend that you you get one of these devices and understand your own uh, reaction and and understand what you can do about that to get your number back down out of that pre-diabetic range. When you say we, are you talking about Sapiens? The, the company, yes. Okay, so yes. help me understand, uh, you wear this device, so, the, so the company... Me, okay. Yeah, let me back up. The, the platform um, takes inputs from a variety of sources, from fitness devices, from your medical record, from genomics, and it, it uniquely combines them together in, in an AI platform that spits out what we call a well score, a wellness uh, and longevity extended score. The score is um, uh, been normalized, so you're not penalized for your age or, or it's adjusted for age and gender. Mm-hmm. Um, so my score, hypothetically 700, um, is unique to me, but because we've taken age and gender out of it, you can then compare a population of data uh, of individuals scores. Mm. So me at a 700 would be very different for a 20 year old at a 700, but yet you can compare the fact that we're both 700s, right? So, so we deliver this score in much the same way. Um, FICO delivers a score for your finances, right? So FICO has been successful in getting their, my FICO score established as an industry standard. Anytime you get a new credit card or a home loan or whatever, they have to look at your FICO score. So imagine that for for your health. That makes me so excited. Right. So, and you're calling it a what? A well score, wellness and ex- and longevity extended as well. And just for very briefly, EL. Larry, are there other companies coming up with scores like this? Uh, scores are very popular. Mm. Uh, no, no doubt. Mm. Everyone, everyone's got a got a score yeah. of of some sort these days. There are a couple competitors. Mm. Um, we believe we're very unique in a couple ways. We're unique in that we're continuous. A lot of um, uh, corporate uh, insurance these days will ask you to take a um, health risk assessment. And a health risk assessment is essentially a survey. And it's one time. You take a survey. They take mm. a look at where you are from a health perspective. They provide a rate to your employer. Okay, the, uh, yeah, this person's in this category and he gets this kind of a rate. And you're done. What's unique about our platform is we're continuous and we're portable. So you sign up on our platform, you work for whatever company that that company has um, providing Sapiens as a benefit, you sign up. Now you, we can, we can, you can monitor your own health every day, every week, every month to see, you know, track how you're doing and be the benefactor of these, what we call signals we can deliver to you, which is not just a score, but it for, uh, based on your individual risks, we can tell you, you know, glucose is a problem for you or cholesterol is a problem for you or your weight is a problem for you. Whatever your risk might be, it's individualized and you would continue to monitor that. We'd recommend ways for you to improve. And then once you do, we'd have another set of recommendations. So it's not a one and done. It's continuous. I love it. Uh, and then secondly, we feel we're unique because we're tying in genomics. Mm. So genomics is going to tell us what you're predisposed to. Mm. So if you have particular variants in your, in your genome, 
that say you may be at more risk for a heart disease or more, more risk for an Alzheimer's than someone who doesn't have that variant, we can then take action and, and provide that information to you to say, hey, if you're predisposed to being susceptible to high cholesterol, for example, um, we would say, hey, um, you might want to talk to your physician about this. Be, you know, your cholesterol is, is a little bit high, but you're, you're predisposed to that, so you might want to really consider that as part of your, your treatment. We're not going to prescribe anything for no, you, but no. we're, we're going to suggest you. But let's talk about the cholesterol thing, for instance. Mm-hmm. So the cholesterol levels will come in some doofus printout from right. my lab, right? Right. Can you ingest, do, does, how, how do you ingest in your data modeling? How do you get those? Uh, that, that, that's a great question. So the whole goal here is to minimize effort for you, right? So we are integrating with a number of um, APIs to do that. Uh, so our first prototype uh, runs on Apple, runs on iOS, and we're using Apple's uh, application called uh, Apple Health, um, which which uh, has a, has integrations with a lot of electronic medical systems. Mm. There's some new medical interface standards out there. I won't bore you with those details, but suffice it to say, Apple is is a leader okay. in in integrations with with medical systems. So what you do is you go into Apple Health, you go into the medical records part of it. You log in to your medical record system. You then consent to say, I'm, I'm allowing Sapiens to read this information in order to compute the score for you. And then we're, you're done. We're, we're able to collect everything we need from your physician who has ordered the labs for you. Uh, so that just goes in. So your cholesterol, your glucose, you know, a, a couple other other lab results. We will automatically fetch and feed those into the into the data model. I love model. that. Yeah, I love that. Um, and then we're looking at other technology partners to open that up even further. So the whole goal is to make it as less painful as possible mm. for you. Do you think that? Do you think we're going to get to a place where? I mean, obviously, this is a health device now. It where, absolutely. Where is. is it going? I mean, where are we going? Like right now with the EKG. It's I love that. So I love that app, by the way. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, it's so exciting for me. So we're uh, getting all of our physical activity, which is one of the inputs to our model from, from your watch and from your phone. Um, the way they're collecting data is really, really interesting. They're being fairly sophisticated in the way they're categorizing the type of activity, whether you're walking, standing, exercising, working out. So one of the inputs to our model is METs, which is active calories that you're burning every day. And, and that, that's important for our model. But um, knowing that these METs were achieved by a vigorous workout versus these were just achieved by standing or walking, that's really important. And Apple's, Apple's really leading, you know, in, in that. And now, with, like, like you said, the, the ECG, you know, application, I play with that myself. You know, we're, we're, we're a walking medical device now. This is, uh, and I, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. How do you think we're going to, so Dexcom obviously is an invasive device, right? mildly invasive it, it, it it's just a little device that you literally chink onto your onto your on your abdomen it has a very very small flexible needle that goes in much less evasive than a finger prick mm. and I, mean, I think the days of fingerprints finger pricks are sorry that's my phone um the days of fingerprints pricks are uh, are, are limited so do you know one of our ctos and seven ctos um is from BioLink. Okay. And BioLink is a non-invasive glucose test. Nice. Oh. Yeah. So, so, so to my point, right? Um, the, the days of yeah, pricking yourself are probably uh, on the How amazing would it be if one can get blood samples? So, so I know of another startup through a, um, um, one of the uh, co-founders of EcoATM. Uh, who is um, building a kiosk to, to to collect samples using the micro that same kind of micro technology? So I, I think that's I think this is right around the yeah. corner where like I feel like some sort of implant probably at some point implant or or something that is much less evasive than sticking a needle in. Mm. I mean, some tests require full full blood draw, I'm sure, but there are others that may not. Mm. And for the ones that only require a, a micro micro sample. Um, you know, I think, I think technology is right around the Hmm. corner to, to make our lives so much easier. (laughs) I, I, I really love how I was just having this discussion with someone the other day. 
about how when Apple's product team was sitting in you know in a room saying, "Well, what is this watch going to be?" Yeah. That moment when someone said, "This is going to be a health device." Yeah. It's not a watch. It's not an iPhone extension. It's That's right. It's really a. That's right. It's health. Yeah. That and and they're they are uh, they are they are absolutely achieving that. Well, I know something's huge because you, you and. You're wearing an Apple Watch. I'm wearing the Series 4. And um, you used to be sort of deep in with Android. What's I, happened? I, my personal phone is still on Android. Uh, I obviously have many iPhones because of product development. <laughs> um, but I am sold on on Apple Watch as a medical device. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, they, they, are, they are leading in that, in that area and doing a heck of a good job. And companies like Sapiens are now able to leverage that. I mean, their whole motivation of Apple Health is to enable companies like us to develop, you know, more interesting, better and better and better sort of applications on top of that. And they are not kidding. We were able to integrate with them, get your lab results, get your fitness information. Very, very straightforward. This is a very easy API to inter interface with. And, you know, we are the benefactor of, of Apple leading in that. Can area. I sign up for Sapiens? At the moment, you can certainly sign up. Um, for limited pilot, uh, probably Q1 next year. We're, we're currently conducting internal tests right now, so let's get the kinks worked out of the system first. But um, but, you, but but Sapiens is a B two B two C, right? Yeah, Sapiens is a B two B two C. So so what we would do is um, I, I'm sure we're going to open it up for for testers to individuals uh, probably early next year. Uh, but I would maybe encourage seven CTOs as a business to maybe uh, maybe help us pilot I'm pilot from a business perspective. This, so. If you can add more birthdays, why not? Absolutely, we should all be interested in that. Do you yeah. do you do you have any data on how you're actually going to? So you're going to have all this awareness and alerts and machine. So through machine learning, I'm assuming you're going to be able to then project and say, well, based on all this bazillions of data, data points yeah. we have yeah. aggregated across your, your genetics yeah. type, this is um, how old we think you're going to get if you carry on down this path? It, it, is it think a prediction? Of it as, or? Yeah, think of it as more of a, of a risk model, and we can project whether your, your um, normal risk, higher risk, or lower risk of, of, of premature mortality in the next 10 years. That's what the current model okay, okay. within the next ten years li literally does. So yes. that's a so that's where the FICO score comes in when it's like that's you're, correct. You're, that's correct. You either have good so credit if you're or bad if you're credit. below a certain number score number, then you're a higher risk. And and more importantly, okay, well, what are those specific risks that are causing that problem? We know that, and we can tell you that, and then we can tell you what specifically you'd, you'd want it. What to is do the about what that. is the minimum? What what are the minimum tests slash devices I have to participate in to get my great, wellness score? Great question. So the current model we're working with now is a 12 risk model. So we need about 16 inputs to calculate your score. There's four that are fitness related, four that are clinically lab, clinical lab related, um, uh, four that are fitness or behavior related, four labs, and then four food items. So we're tracking uh, the amount of fish, fruit, vegetables, and nuts that you eat. Uh, those are impacts to your score. We're tracking the amount of vigorous physical activity you do, whether you're a smoker or not, whether you're a safe driver, uh, whether you wear your seatbelt specifically. And then we're looking at um, blood pressure uh, and BMI. Uh, and then labs, from a lab perspective, we're looking at total and LDL cholesterol. We're looking at fasting glucose, and we're looking at the A1C glucose, which is that running average. Um, so all those feed into what we're calling our product one uh, 12 risk model. And so the output of the model will be able to identify 12, up to 12 mm -hmm. risks that you could then take action on to um, add years to your life. We'll be extending that in 2019 to a 45 risk model. Mm. So the data we're working right now is 2015. The data we'll be upgrading to, I believe, is 2017, and that adds a whole lot more um, data input. So a couple of the areas we feel that we're innovative. One is the way that we're interfacing to various 
systems to help gather this data uh, as automatically as we can. Secondly, is the way we're going to be um, collecting food uh, mm. intake. So we've, we've spent a lot, I've personally spent a ton of time on all these food apps. Mm. Lose it, My Fitness so, Pal, yada, yada, yada. Ton of them out there. It's exhausting. And it's, um, you're, we're never going to get someone to interact at the level that a company like Lose It wants you to interact with, you know, logging every meal and, and uh, taking a picture and things like that. So we're, we're trying to innovate ways we would collect that same information, but we're not interested in necessarily in calories. We're not interested in ways that Lose It oh, is interested in collecting data. We're interested in the types of food because of the nutrients, because there are certain things like omega-3 and uh, good, good fats that are, a, that are protective against certain diseases, right? So I don't care how many calories you ate. I care that you ingested fish a certain number of times per week and omega-3s and nuts. And, and those are all uh, inputs to these risk models that we do care about. So we feel like we've got some intellectual property in the area of, of helping you record that information with as less friction as we can. And boy, that's tough. Can, um, can you speak of that or is it still uh, the, secret? Uh, I wouldn't say it's super secret, but I would say it's, it's uh, the way we're capturing is somewhat unique. So with our app, um, we've got ways where you can, you can, with minimal interaction, we'll ask you uh, on a periodic basis, hey, did you have any blah, 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 you know, for lunch or dinner? And, and you just, you know, simple click and you're done. Mm. Um, so we're not asking you. You're not asking like, hey, what did you eat? You're yeah. asking. I'm not asking you, you to look up what you ate in a, in a, in a you know, million yeah. row database yeah. of all yeah. this food stuff. I'm asking you for the specific things that matter to our risk mm. models. What did you consume? And then we're trending that over time. Can I add? So. We, we we spoke earlier about the tips for living longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm adding fish and nuts to that. Um, You're saying one of the one of the recommendations we may tell you is a hey, we we think by increasing the amount of fish you eat, maybe as opposed to red meat or whatnot, um, will increase your omega three fatty acid level, and so that's going to reduce your risk of heart. And increase your mercury problems. poisoning levels. Well, that too. <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> that has been a deterrent for me. To, yeah. For, for me to eat yeah. fish. Yeah. It sucks. Understand. Yeah. No, that's but, wonderful. It, but it's interesting. It, it, we, we feel, my CEO feels that, very strongly feels that the omega-3, the benefit of the omega-3 actually from eating fish is much better than than the benefit of omega three through a supplement. Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's varying opinions, yes, you know, on that. I yes. don't want to get into my it. My dad, but. my dad went through a phase where he would call us from South Africa and say, "Hey, I sent you some omega three pills." Right. I I take omega three supplements. You know, I figure what you know what harm can it do? But I also do pay attention to you know fish is a pretty significant amount of my diet. The so. the thing I try to do about fish is. Whenever I go to restaurants for dinner, I always try and order the fish as a rule mm -hmm. to get that fish in because mm -hmm. it's a little harder to cook. Yeah. It's not I, something I, that you naturally yeah. cook. I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I have certain things I do at home that I feel I'm pretty good at, but um, yeah, but I generally agree. <laughs> so, uh, Larry, this is, I feel like you're, uh, you're, you're giving my children a, a better future, man. I certainly hope so. You know, I, I think we have a lot of business opportunities with this, with this concept. I think, uh, you know, one thing I, I, I'd want to make a point of is um, we feel like the life insurance industry is a big, big potential customer of ours. Um, we all have the same goal as your life insurance company. We all want to keep you alive. They want to keep you alive so they don't have to pay a benefit. And you want to be alive because you prefer to be alive. So, so we feel like, you know, that's, that's an absolute area where this is almost a no brainer, you know, for us to, for us to go after. So we're really excited about that. I love it. That. I love it. Yeah. So I'm um, going to keep a close eye on Santa. Right on. Right on. And then, uh, are you going to be Santa this year? I have been Santa and I may do it again. Yeah. So, um, what do you say to children who tug at your beard? <laughs> hey, don't pull too hard. It's, you're going to see something you don't want to see. 
<laughs> no, that's been a tradition of mine for, I don't know, the last five, six, seven years. It, it all started back when I lived downtown and we, we did a, um, uh, uh, annual pub crawl called the Santa cause pub crawl. And that was for a colon cancer uh, benefit. There was 200 Santas that all dressed up and we oh. all rode the San Diego trolley and wow. went around and collected uh, donations for a charity so that they're no longer doing that, but I still have my Santa suit. And so my wife and I like to like to um, donate our time this, this time of year for various, mm. various charities. So we, we've gone to senior centers and we hand out toys and candy canes and, and uh, uh, it feels good to donate time and, and got to put that Santa suit to it. use. Yes. Yes. And it includes the beard. Absolutely. So I feel like this show is about optimism, longevity, Doing good. Yes. Man. Yeah. I want to be a better person. Life's too short not to be optimistic. Larry, thanks for hanging. Absolutely. Great to be here. See see you soon again. Okay, take care. Cheers. Have you chatted with the CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com. For more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs, we also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.